Um, welcome to the Art History with the Artist and the Librarian. Today's program is going to be Mary Cassatt. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, if you want it to go to everyone so that everyone can see your question, you're going to want that too to be all panelists and attendees. I will be reading the all the questions at the end of the program. Sometimes I might catch one while I'm going, but just in case, I will kind of read them all through at the end. There's a lot of different directions I could have gone with this program because Mary Cassatt, she dives into different mediums and she has so many different little topics that you could dive into and discuss. So, so if you want something else to share at the end that I didn't cover, I think there's probably a lot of different things that you can mention. All right. Mary Stevenson Cassatt was born into an affluent family in 1844 in Algany City, which is now part of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And her father was a banker and he was strongly against her wishes of becoming a professional artist. He wanted to protect her from quote unquote, the equivalent of trolls who harassed and followed public figures, especially women. Despite these objections, objection, she attended the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia at the age of 15. The instructors and the male students were patronizing, and she wasn't allowed to work with live models, which if we know anything about Mary Cassatt, she primarily works with using the figure. Um, she was allowed to paint still lifes, or there was a flag making class, which sounds oh so much fun if you really want to do portraiture. But um, because of not getting the education that she was looking for, she then goes over to Paris, which she had spent some time in childhood in, in France as well. And um, she continued her academic pursuits at the um, Ecole des Beaux-Arts in 1865 at the age of 21. And this is actually through private lessons with the instructors because Beaux-Arts didn't have women students at that time. So it's interesting um, just to kind of put in perspective where she was in this time frame and what she was allowed to accomplish and then what she was kind of pushing ahead to do what she wanted and make happen. And this is a self portrait of her as well as a, a photograph. Here's an example of one of her earlier works that was accepted into the 1868 Salon painted after her visit to Italy. And she signed it Mary Stevenson. And part of the reason for that is her father mentioning that um, women might get harassed if they knew her name. So she wanted to kind of keep out of the spotlight. And that's why she used her mother's maiden name and, and, instead of Mary Cassatt. Um, and why is this one of the few works that are her early works still around? Well, I did not realize this, but first she had returned home in 1870 at the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which lasted from July 1870 to May 1871. And then she had to go live with her parents again, much to her chagrin. And then she moved to Chicago and she was working with a gallery in Chicago with a lot of her art to try and get it sold which timed perfectly with the horrific Great Chicago Fire of 1871. And I don't know if you um, know the old folk song, Old Mrs. Leary with, uh, with the cow knocked over um, a lantern. And well, anyways, the, the fire lasted three days. A lot got destroyed, including a lot of Mary Cassatt's early pieces. This is surviving because it was sold after that exhibit and was already in a private collection. And you can see how she was influenced by more of the masters at this time. She was going to like the Louvre, she was going traveling, she was going to museums. And the museums at that time, a lot of times you could set up an easel and you would be painting in front of a piece. So you really are mimicking the styles that were um, shown, um, especially at like the Louvre. She was able to go back to Europe shortly afterwards and um, studied in Spain. She wanted to study the, the Spanish masters in early 1870s. And she traveled alone, which is pretty wild. Um, the Spanish dancer was exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1874 and caught the eye of Edgar Degas. And he noted 
there is someone who feels as I do. And you can kind of see a little bit of that like brush stroke, the uh, spontaneousness in, in the lace that may have attracted him to her painting style. And after the bullfight is a traditional Spanish subject matter. However, notice that it's a casual moment with the bullfighter. He's, he's relaxed, he's having a cigarette. He, um, it, it's, it's capturing a moment which very much parallels with Impressionist work later that we'll talk about in more detail. But um, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece. And though it mimics some of the, the masters, there is a modernization to her work. And she's developing her own stylization. Okay, so I can't mention Mary Cassatt without Edgar Degas. And I'm sure most of you might know his work. I'm gonna show a piece of his a little later if you don't, uh, but he's known most for the, the ballerinas. And um, they just, they met in 1877, a little bit after he had seen some of her work and then she was very influenced by his. There was like a gallery in Paris where she would just like stop by the shop window and, and stare at his work. So there was a influence before she was even able to meet him. And they met in 1877, they became fast friends. He was 10 years older than her, um, but they were both very intellectual. They both had similar family backgrounds. I think both of their fathers were bankers. And um, they spent like at least two decades working with each other in their studios. So it was kind of like a studio mate, like, hey, what do you think of this? Or should I change this? And um, bounce ideas back and forth off of each other, inspiring each other's practice. And um, they both painted the figure, they both painted modern life. And while some speculate romance, it really seems that they were just really close friends. They were both very independent, fiercely independent and, um, and strong personalities. So they worked better, I think, just as friends. So Little Girl in Blue Armchair is a piece that Cassatt finished with the help of um, her friend Edgar Degas. There's even some testing where one of the museums like did a um, kind of x-ray where they could tell that some of the brushwork didn't match all of the other their brushwork position is awkward. Um, it, the girl looks bored. Like at this time, usually you would see very prim and proper posed pictures of children. You're not gonna see this like waiting, like just chilling um, portrait that um, this one is. And it's a friend of Edgar Degas, um, their child. So there's a connection there as well with the piece. And while looking at the painting, it looks very spacious and that's very much due to how the furniture is arranged, but this piece is only three by four feet in size. So the scale of it is actually very small, but it looks expansive. Um, and composition can do a lot with how a, a painting feels. And I really enjoy the pup that's sitting on the one of the chairs. And that was Mary Cassatt's dog named Baptiste, and she adored, and its nickname was Batty. It was given as a gift. I'm just kind of jumping into Impressionism. The main thing in the program I'm going to talk about later, I want to dive into her printmaking. Um, so I kind of want to introduce, in, introduce a little bit of the Impressionist um, stylization as well. So Mary Cassatt exhibited with the Impressionist group in 1879, 1880, 1881, and 1886 as one of the only Americans in the group and one of four women. The other women was um, Berth Marisat, Eva Gonzalez, and Marie Brockamond. And um, just kind of diving just a little bit into what Impressionism is. Uh, the, I do have a, a Degas on the left, just if you, if you haven't seen Degas before, a Manet as, as well as a Monet. Artists leading the French Impressionist group of, of painters included Cezanne, Manet, Monet, Renoir, Bizarro, Degas, and so forth. And this movement flourished in the 1870s and 1880s. It pushed back against that traditional academic painting style. And key components include day, uh, uh, scenes from everyday life. There's a lot of light and movement. Um, it's capturing an impression of the day and, or a moment that's happening. 
And in that moment, there's light movement and motion, there's spontaneity in the brush strokes. Um, that's also another key component. And the, the hand of the artist is very well seen. Uh, and then what I mean by that, you can tell um, it's, it's a painting and you can see those brush strokes. They're purposeful. Many of the paintings were set outdoors, some even painted en plein air, which means they took their materials. I think um, Monet often did this, where he would take his materials on an easel and you would paint outside right then and there just to capture that moment and get the colors right. And, and, um, and so he's one of the ones I think of most when I think of en plein air. And the colors were often bold and bright, and which I didn't realize, but some of the colors of blue were new to that time period. So they were newly being developed where you could buy them from the store with that brightness of saturation, especially the blues. And while we look at Impressionism now, and we think these pieces are so tame, they were rebels of their time. And before they were coined Impressionism, they called themselves independents. And um, they, they were quite radical in the way they were transforming what they were doing. And many of the other artists at this time are painting like neoclassical pieces. So they're once again, going back to the Greco-Roman uh, tradition. So it's kind of interesting to see both of those happening simultaneously. So like classical versus impressionism, there is a distinct difference of the two. And when Cassatt began to paint with the Impressionists, she said, at last I could work with some complete independence. And the Loge at the Opera was the first of Cassatt's Impressionist paintings to be displayed in the United States. So she's like primarily living in, in Paris, but she does travel over and she does do a lot in getting art that's in the Impressionist group over into the United States, getting that popularity to build up, um, connections with the museums and galleries as well. But this is the first one that was shown in a, in a gallery show in Boston in 1878. And the critics decide, uh, described the piece as striking, adding that Cassatt's painting surpassed the strength of most men. And the atmosphere is set in a modern theater in Paris and while Cassatt isn't the first Impressionist to use the theater as a setting, because think Edgar Degas, he's painting all the ballerinas in the theater, but his are focused on the performers, where hers is focused on the spectator. So this is an activity that she would have been able to do. She would have been able to go to the, the opera. This most likely is her sister, Lydia. And the piece is really cool because it kind of creates um, a bit of a kind of a triangle and you become part of the triangle. So if you stare at this piece, you can sell, see that Lydia is looking out into the distance, probably at another spectator. But in the background, there's a gentleman who is staring at her with opera glasses as well. So you become kind of part of this like voyeuristic view of what's happening at the opera. And one of the things that she is known for is painting these very fashionable ladies. So, so the fashion is very high fashion at that time period, with the bonnet and, um, and sitting at the opera. And uh, her female lead looks very real. She's got a serious look in her face and she's focused and, but she's not painted on a pedestal. She's not a painted doll. She's, she's, more, she feels more real, not from like the male perspective. Mary Cassatt's sister and parents moved over to Paris in 1877 and her brothers and their families would visit very often. So you'll often see paintings that she's done of their families, their children, um, as well as her sister. And this one is one of her mother. Um, family life is often featured. And this is a beautiful picture of her mother, Catherine, reading the Parisian daily newspaper, Le Figaro. And the use of light in this one, there's like so many different shades of white, which I think is fascinating. So just slightly, slightly gray, slightly yellow shades of white. And um, so it's, it's, it, and it still has that spontaneous um, brushwork 
And it is just that capturing of a, of a moment, an impression. Her father's opinion of his daughter's work changed drastically because she's starting to get some credibility. Like people are starting to recognize her as an impressionist painter. She's well known for her work. And so he's really proud of her talents in, in the modern or uh, Parisian art world. And he keeps all of her, her newspaper reviews and he'll you know, tell her brother all about what she's up to. Um, so she's gaining notoriety. She was even able to, I think, you know, pay for her own fabulous dresses as well as a, um, a whole estate that was hers. Um, There's a beautiful, big mansion. So Lydia was often a subject, and this is her close sister. They did so much together. Um, however, her health was very, she was frequently ill, and she did pass away in 1882 from Bright's disease. Um, but these two pieces, you can see, um, once again, the fashion in autumn with that, that bonnet and the use of the 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 strokes of um, the brushwork, as well as in the women at the um, tapestry loom is one where Lydia is depicted doing handicrafts. So there's some where she's crocheting, there's some where she's, this one was working on the loom, where she's weaving, but um, kind of really showing what, it, what activities uh, females would do behind the doors. And this is really where we're going to kind of change gears because I wanted to talk more about her printmaking. And to do that, I need to introduce the um, Japanese Edo period uh, and the printmaking, the tr traditional printmaking. The link here is um, Freer Saxler Museum of Asian Art, which is the leading Smithsonian Museum of Asian Art. Um, it, it steps through the process of making a piece like this where all the plates and, and how you layer everything and um, it has to be just exact, but the it's a beautiful video. It's very calming and I'm going to link that in the chat box at the end of the program so you don't have to worry about writing it down at this time, but I highly recommend checking it out because um, it's really cool. So the Edo region is um, now known as Tokyo. And the Edo period is from 1615 through 1868. And um, there was not a lot of trade during this period. It was very closed off. And that's why it's really exciting once trade resumes and then the pieces become more globalized and then seeing the influence onto the Western art world. And the prints from this time are, are called the ukiyo-e, or Pictures of the Floating World. It's a super modern city of, of its time, and the prints showcase all different classes and various forms of entertainment and daily activity. Um, the floating world depictions that attracted Kassat would have been the domestic, you know, day-to-day -day events of women's lives, and such as this one where they're making dumplings. Um, and I think that impression of a moment also kind of parallels with the Impressionist movement. And 1853 is when the Japanese ports resumed uh, trade and um, it included woodcut prints of the ukiyo-e school. And uh, these pieces being shown in the West had a dramatic impact on the art world. Other artists, um, that also were influenced by the Japanese woodcut prints include Claude Monet, Toulouse Lautrec, and Edgar Degas. And the styles would be a little different depending on which artist you're looking at. Cassatt fell in love with this um, ukiyo-e school of printmaking uh, and an exhibit that came to Paris in 1890 at the Ecole des Beaux Arts in, in Paris. And um, so, 1890 is the, the year that she was really exposed to it. And then we're gonna see the prints that she made right after seeing the exhibit. So I found a really cool thing while I was doing my research. And um, I knew she was influenced by the Japanese woodcut prints, but I, I didn't know which ones. But when doing the research on um, 
her own prints, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, a family member had actually had those pieces that she owned and then donated them to the museum. So these are pieces that the ones I'm showing you next are the ones that were in her personal collection. She would have seen them and most likely been very influenced by these pieces specifically. So I'm gonna show you one of the Edo prints as well as I'm gonna match it up with one of her prints. And so you'll be able to do a little bit of parallel and comparison as well. If you notice something that I don't see, please put it in that chat box. So she produced 10 prints inspired by the 1890 exhibit. And um, the, all of these prints are, are mostly scenes of intimate um, inside the house featuring women. And the pieces are by the same artists. So Kitagawa Udamaro is the artist's name. And this one in particular is called Peeping. And so you can see the little child is probably looking at either the mother or the, a family member. And this is one of Mary Cassatt's that would have been produced right afterwards called The Bath. And her technique would be different. It's not a wood cut print, it's, it's dry point and aqua tint. So the dry point technique is more an etching into metal and um, then layering the aqua tint for the color panels as well. So, so metal etching versus the, the woodcut prints. So this, the, while the techniques are different, there are still some parallels just, just kind of looking at them side by side. One thing that none of the prints were considered impressionist um, because the different medium, however, one thing that she kept was not using the color black. Um, so there's just the really dark browns in her work, um, which does soften the look to it a little bit. But um, that's one thing that kept it a little more impressionistic, even though we can't really coin these as impressionist pieces by Mary Cassatt, even though they're, they're one of my favorites. So the bath painting is, is one where she's giving the child a bath. And uh, I love the way that she's actually holding the child in her arms. And there's parallels to the tender touch of the child over on the um, Edo print as well with peeping. And even just looking at the tiny baby toes and the baby butt, there's some parallels over there as well. Um, the toes are curled in very similar manner. Um, one of the things that the, the printmaking um, kind of basing it, it kind of flattens that background a little bit more. Your perspective gets a little shifted and that influence definitely pulled in. And there's a lot of textile prints that I find fascinating that are paralleled. And as well as the, I think the treatment of the hair and the way the hair is, is is um, sketched out is, is very similar. Maternal Caress is one of my favorites in this series. And the background once again has that flatness, which references the Edo prints and the duplication of pattern next to pattern. So the Edo print by Kitawa, Kitogawa Udamaro is, um, this one is the third panel of a whole piece. And so I found what the whole piece would have looked like. And it's two women and a young man under a cherry tree. However, it is also supposed to be the story of a parody of the imperial carriage scene. There's a lot of humor in Edo prints, which um, is fun to look at. And just, it, it, there's a playfulness to them. And uh, I really just wanted to look at those textile prints, because there is a, a lot of patterning going on, which looks very similar. So maybe this one, as well as there's another one I want to show next that also has like the stripes. So we've got the flattening of the space. There's also an awkwardness of the space. And if you remember the girl in the, the blue armchair, how everything was kind of disjointed and um, kind of awkward in its placement. Even just looking at 
this the mirror um, piece of furniture and then there's a bit of the wall kind of going off to the side and that doesn't quite line up. Um, your line work is a little bit, just a little funky, but um, once again, we've got pattern, pattern, pattern. There's pattern in the dress, pattern in the carpet, pattern on the, the base. Now this one, I'm paralleling to this piece, which I found more story to this piece as well that I thought was interesting. And it's the last piece from um, of the Edo prints from Mary Cassatt's personal collection that I'm gonna show. But it's another Kitagawa Udamaro piece, Takashima Ohisa. And uh, many of the Edo prints would celebrate beauties. So they could be like courtesans or geishas, or they could be regular women in the, in the city. And Ohisa was the daughter of a tea shop. So she worked at a tea shop and she was a very popular subject matter for artists, especially Udamaro. And she must have been lovely um, since several of the artists really liked to paint her around the 1790s. And the mirror has her family's kind of crest. So it is a triple oak leaf crest of the Takashima family. And you'll see that in other pieces featuring her as well. But there's a little bit different of the perspective of the two um, from the female point of view versus the male point of view. You've still got the mirrors, which I think is interesting. And though Mary Cassatt's is, is bathing, it's still kind of like a modest view of that. And uh, a lot of Mary Cassatt's works, they seem very pensive or private in, in the moment. Um, whereas when you look at this piece by um, Udamaro, it, it's still, she's a, she's a beauty. She's being glamorized and, and she is put on a little bit more of a pedestal, uh, kind of showing off, off that beauty. Okay, I'm not gonna dive too much into these prints. However, I still wanna share them because we once again have a lot of the flattening of the space in the background. This one has the mirror reflection as well. The fitting has pattern against pattern, the wall versus the dresses. And the letter, this one's another one just to notice the line work and the angles and how awkward they are. Uh, the desk is doing something very strange. Um, and then there's pattern and pattern once again, kind of just contrasting awkwardly next to each other. Uh, even the background pattern looks slightly different in certain spots. Um, and the envelope is also a little wonky in terms of perspective, which is, is something that the Impressionists did a, a little bit as well and, and being influenced by the Edo prints, um, especially with the backgrounds and flattening of, of the depth. In the omnibus shows women traveling by themselves independently. Uh, it's most likely a nanny holding the baby with the mother and they're all fashionably dressed on their, their outing. And um, this is the last one of the series of 10 prints I'm gonna show. However, you can research for more of them. Uh, each one had about 25 prints made. And a lot of them were kind of give, sold most likely to, to the museums and as whole collections with all 10. So if you wanna see the rest of them, you're gonna wanna visit the, the Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art, National Gallery of Art, or the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. And um, you'll just go to the website and then you're gonna search the collection. And the collection allows you to kind of just type in Mary Cassatt and it's gonna pull up everything. And you'll notice which ones are most likely the, the prints. The, the, the 10 are her primary ones that she did for printmaking, though she did some that look a little more etched, um, a little more detailed. These are a little bit more simple in, in the detailing. So you can distinguish which ones would have been in this group versus um, other prints that she did. All right, I've got a comment on the, the babies appear elongated again. So let's take a look. And there's a simplicity to the way the feet are done sometimes in her pieces. Um, I've noticed that in a few of hers where 
the face will be super detailed and like the shoulders and then it just gets less and less detailed as it gets to those feet, which also creates that elongated look. The child's bath features an intimate moment between mother and daughter and they're very focused on each other. Uh, the mother seems to be reassuring or talking to her little one. This very much looks like some of the prints that we just showed earlier. And um, it's a very realistic portrayal. You as a viewer are also kind of a voyeur in the scene, like the way that you're looking directly at the piece almost feels like you're seeing what's happening. I don't know if you feel that way when you watch, look at the piece. Um, and there's a little bit of the perspective is shifting. Like if you look at the bowl versus the vase, they're slightly different perspectives. And then you've got the patterning happening again. So you've got the wallpaper and the, the, the carpeted floor is a different pattern as well as the, the dress and the dresser in the background. And the flattening of that background, once again, is it's similar to the, the Edo print, um, Japanese woodblock inspirations. But this is one of my favorite pieces. Um, whoops, I'm jumping. Okay. And the boating party, I thought, also shows the influence on the Japanese woodblock prints, just in terms of kind of losing the perspective of depth a little bit more. It kind of flattens out that background space, but you're still having the impressionist painting, painterly, um, those spontaneous brush strokes and like her dress. Um, and it's once again, mother and child, since that is her, one of her favorite, um, one of her more favorite uh, subjects to paint. And this one was the highlighted piece of her first solo exhibit. So imagine, female artist, solo exhibit in the United States in 1895. That's pretty impressive. I don't even, I can't even think of who else would have had solo shows at that time. So I'll have to do a little more research on that. And the young woman in black and green bonnet is done in pastels. And so she, it, she jumps mediums, which is really cool. And pastel is something that both her and Degas worked in. She developed her own style. However, she kept that impressionistic quality to it. it, it um, the face is very detailed and shaded. And then it starts getting a little bit more abstracted as we go on. And you get a bit more of that impressionistic um, kind of impulsive, Breast strokes with the pastels. And she made it her own. She was very noted for her pastel paintings, or not paintings, but her pastel art pieces. And so the pastels, I thought was interesting that she actually had gifted out some of her pastels later in life. And so the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has a collection of her actual pastels that she would have used. So pastels, I don't know if you remember using them, they're more oil pastels. So you, they're like a stick and then you, you more draw with them and you can do some shading. And I don't know what the technique to um, kind of freeze it to where it doesn't start smearing would have been at this time. Like now somebody might just do like hairspray or something like that to kind of set the pastels. Um, but there was two different boxes of pastels. I think the National Gallery of Art is the other one. And she had given one set to like a, a granddaughter of a friend who was like 10. And so she felt really bad later in life realizing that she had been like playing with them and giving them away. And, and it was still a pretty full set um, when it made it to the museum. But just to kind of note that how how cool that would be to own something that Mary Cassatt actually had done, made art with. But this is not uh, just the only one I'm gonna show of the, her pastel work, but there's a ton more pieces. So if you're gonna do some more research, I highly recommend checking out just her pastel work. And this is the last piece I wanna highlight. Um, once again, I could go in so many directions with Mary Cassatt's work. So I'm really just kind of like dipping a little bit into what she did. And she was a suffragette. She was, she really, she was a strong independent woman. She wanted equal education. She wanted the right to vote. And so um, I put a link on the bottom, which is a, a doctoral thesis by Nikki 
Georgopoulos, which was interesting perspective on this piece of women with a sunflower. And so the sunflower was the official symbol for the National American Women Suffrage Association, which is NASA, since 1896. And there's two buttons here. So one in 18, um, maybe, maybe I have my dates wrong because it looks like 1846, 1848 here. Um, but the other one's 1904. So they kept that symbol and in her painting is the, the sunflower becomes more of a, an actual sunflower, but it's still pinned almost like a button, which I think is, is a kind of a, one of the direct parallels. And the second direct parallel is that she um, created an exhibit with some friends in, in 1915. And this piece was shown in that and all the works in the show would help fund the suffrage movement. So, so this was her contribution to that piece or that exhibit as well. And so it does have a direct tie to suffrage. So she, she fought for gender equality her whole life. And to kind of wrap up, um, in her later years, she did not do a lot of painting. She started going blind due to cataracts in 1914. And so um, her later years, she didn't do a lot of artwork, which was, and it took away a lot of her independence as well. But she still looks adorable. And, and she did pass away from in 1926. She tried cataract surgery, but at that time it was not as successful. And there were a few impressionist painters that ended up getting cataracts. And it may have been something to do with medium as well as a tie or um, just a coincidence. Okay, so two pieces that are two books that I wanted to point out from the Bay County Public Library, Northwest Regional Library System Collection, um, American Women of Achievement, Mary Cassatt. This is a children's title in the nonfiction uh, collection. However, it was really informative. I found like the fact that she was in a flag making class when she was um, in the Philadelphia school uh, was in there, like just like random little tidbits that I couldn't find easily online were housed in this book and, and it was it was entertaining, really well put together. And the second one is the British Museum Floating World Japan in, in the Edo period by John Reeve. And it's a fantastic little introduction to um, the Edo prints and it's small. It's a really short, quick read, um, but the cool thing with this one is there was another piece by Ketagawa Udamaro, and it features the tea shop beauty that we mentioned before, Ohisa, and includes a poem by the artist about the beauty. So um, if you wanna kind of look at that a little bit more, I recommend checking out Floating World. I plan to do the next art history program in February, 2021. It takes me a little bit of time to do research and I'm thinking of doing the heist one next, but I'm still still deciding if that's gonna be my final. And I'm gonna to plan to do it on the second Tuesday of the month at 2 p.m. Central Time.